Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So I've connected up, amazingly enough, with a pilot in the Ukrainian Air Force. I want to introduce you tonight to Moonfish. He's a squadron commander. Uh, he's a MiG-29 pilot. He studied at the Aviation Leadership Program in the United States from 2016 to 2017. He is a highly professional fighting pilot, and he's got a technical knowledge um, of, uh, of both flying and uh, of English. Um, Moonbeam. Moonfish, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are so you? You're, you're you're somewhere in the Ukraine, but you're not. You don't want to tell us exactly where. Yes. Okay. Tell me what it is you've been doing. Uh, you've been flying and and doing what? So uh, I'm I'm as being a fighter pilot. Uh, me and my fellow pilots, we are conducting air to air missions. Uh, we are. Uh, the, the reason why we have succeeded so far at the majority of air, uh, Ukrainian airspace is by combining efforts of uh, of fighter pilots, uh, fighters, and uh, surface uh, surface to air missile SAMs. Uh, so so far, uh, we we are flying freely in our territory. The exception is some some zones that are being captured. Uh, th that are captured by Russians, and of course they have pulled in a lot, lots of SAMs, and uh, that that really um, uh, in this era we cannot really operate freely. And and tell me, what are your missions? Are they to uh, to uh, scare off, uh, uh, chase away the bombers, or are you um, going after uh, convoys, or what? Uh, I would say uh, uh, right now mostly yes. Uh, we are uh, trying to scare away bombers uh, and uh, attack aircraft, frog foods and stuff. And and how successful so, do you think the Ukrainian forces? Of course, those, those, uh, of course, those who dare to uh, uh, to fly on our territory, because we also have SAMs, man pads, and everything else. How successful do you think the Ukrainian air force has been in that regard? Uh, I think if um, if if you look at how outnumbered we are. I think uh, so far we've been uh, we've been doing a good job. Uh, of course, uh, now that this war is, it is certain it, it will not be over soon. Uh, the the fighter jets, so, uh, new stamps are crucial to us, uh, so that we can keep uh, air situation in Ukraine uh, like it is right now, or uh, when we will start like the the, con the counter offense against uh, those parts uh, to, to give uh, to take back those parts of Ukraine. And do you think that's a possibility that there'll be a counter offense? Um, uh, I, I'm not like high rank military official to, to tell to tell you that, but uh, we want our territories back. We want, our, we want to free our people. That is for sure. Now, you're a squadron commander, I understand. Um, what uh, does a squadron commander command? A squadron of fighter jets. How big is the squadron? Um, so, um, <clears throat> it could uh, it could be uh, up to 12, 18 jets. And uh, if you're flying out of uh, uh, um, airports, uh, military airports uh, in Ukraine, I presume. Yes, of course. Um, now we've heard that there's been a reasonable amount of uh, damage of Ukrainian air force uh, uh, airports. Um, have you had to change what airports you're flying out of? Oh yeah, we, mm -hmm. we do it a lot. We have to do that a lot so, so that we can keep our, uh, our jets safe and right. ourselves safe. Okay, uh, has there been a lot of loss of, uh, of jets and pilots in the Ukrainian Air Force? Oh yeah, we, we have had, um, I would say, uh, we've had losses, yes, for sure. No. And, and so one of the things that's been talked about a lot is the idea of, uh, of Poland giving some uh, some MiG fighter jets uh, to Ukraine um, and uh, and that uh, you've been trained on the, flying those jets. Um, is that a smart move? Uh, like for, from my perspective, that is a super smart move uh, uh, that combined with providing us uh, with those SAMs that we also operate like S three hundred, etc. Uh, would would be would be a great boost for our, our air air defense. Um, 
we have we do not have lack of uh, well trained, highly motivated pilots to fly those jets that could could be given to us. And um, yeah, we, we have uh, ground crews all all trained up to to use that. Uh, mm -hmm. What would what would have been um, like the best if uh, somehow we were able to obtain any 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 type of Western jet? Um, I, I have been to training states. You mentioned that I've uh, I had the opportunity to fly uh, some uh, Western fighters, and uh, despite the claims that Russian have uh, that they are uh, they are uh, jets. Are superior to Western. That is completely not true. From uh, I, I'm 100% sure that uh, the tactics, the training that uh, American any NATO country pilot receive is is superior over Russian, as well as their jets. So obtaining a squadron of uh, F-16 would be. I think that that would ch that will change uh, the the situation in my country a lot. That's, that's interesting. I haven't heard that. So do you think there's enough uh, pilots in the Ukrainian Army, sorry, the Ukrainian Air Force, uh, that could pilot uh, um, F-16s? Well, uh, we have to, you have to understand that normally uh, the process of retraining uh, ground personnel and pilots will take years. But given the situation we are in, I think uh, we will be able to, in case this decision will be made, uh, we will be able to pull this off and get those jets fighting in, in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. Really? That's amazing. As, as I mentioned, as I mentioned uh, so we, we I, I cannot give you any numbers, but we right now we have a lot more pilots uh, than the jets, of course. We're chatting tonight with a pilot in the Ukrainian Air Force. Uh, he uh, is coming to us uh, by Zoom from uh, somewhere in Ukraine. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with Moonfish in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Welcome back, everyone, to uh, a special edition of the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with uh, a pilot from the Ukrainian Air Force. His name is Moonfish. Um, he is a pilot of uh, MiG-29. He is a squadron commander. He has studied at the Aviation Leadership Program in the United States from 2016 to 2017. And, uh, and, and he wants to talk uh, to us uh, uh, to obviously uh, give us a sense of what's going on uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Moonfish, can you um, just give me a sense? Uh, um, how old are you? How long have you been flying? How did you get into the Air Force? Uh, so uh, being a pilot uh, has been my dream since I was, since I was a teenager. Um, yes, uh, I feel like uh, you see, I'm, I'm trying to cover my identity a little bit. So uh, may maybe next time I'll tell you my, my age and, and stuff. Yeah, so um, yeah, I've been flying uh, for, for at least 10 years uh, at the MiG-29, at least six years already. Um, it is a fine jet. Uh, we know how to use that. And um, yeah, that's basically it. Now, so you would have started flying after the separation of uh, the Ukraine from the Soviet Union. Were you trained oh, yeah. by uh, Soviet uh, Air Force people or by Ukrainian Air Force people? Um, so I have actually been born after the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, 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 the flight school, the military flight school that we, we are operating currently is a pretty much Soviet era. Uh, Given that I have been at the pilot training in the United States, I've um, I've I've come back, and I've been trying to implement that because, as I just mentioned earlier, I think that uh, American pilot school is uh, way better than the one we 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 have, uh, the, 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 uh, than rather than Russian and Soviet era, and uh, we've been doing our best to imply that. Um, that experience to our Air Force, especially since we are cooperating with uh, California Air National Guard a lot. Uh, they have been at, at the exercises. They are we were like their body of ours. We know pilots by names. And um, well, the California National Guard. Why? Why California Air National, National Guard? Uh, I, I, I can, I can, honestly, I cannot explain why it, 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 it is a California Air National Guard, but 
um, how uh, how do they like choose to cooperate with us or something else? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, we've been working with those pilots a lot. Excellent. Um, now you're getting um, intelligence information. I understand from um, NATO uh, satellite planes, um, radar planes. Um, does that come directly to you? Does it come to the Ukrainian Air Force and then come to you? How is uh, that so, working? Uh, I'm a pilot. I'm a squadron commander. I'm not the C2 guy. Uh, I, I, I have not, nothing to say for you about that. And I, I believe uh, even, if, even if we do receive this kind of information, which I have no evidence of personally, just because, you know, uh, I'm not in that position. Uh, I believe... Um, it is sensitive. It has not to be distributed to pilots, of course. Right. But yeah, the C2, of course. Okay. Um, when you're in the air, is it easy to tell um, a MiG that is Ukrainian versus a MiG that's Russian? Well, first of all, they are uh, using, they are not using lots of MiGs. Uh, mostly they are uh, Suhoi 25, uh, 34, uh, Suhoi 30, 35 fighter jets. Uh, they're way bigger. And um, uh, like uh, it was pretty intense in the first couple of days. That that is where uh, all those dog dogfight occurred. Most most of them. And um, right now we are we are dis we uh, we distance from them a little bit away. Uh, it's it's not that brutal as it was first couple of days, but. Uh, I don't think that that is really a problem to uh, to confuse our jet with their jet. Not really. One of the questions lots of people have asked is, is there something that 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 uh, the Ukrainian Air Force could be doing better to destroy these convoys of supplies that appear to be coming in from Russia? What are you what are you able to do in that regard? <clears throat> so um, uh, to understand um, the situation right now, it's a little bit. Uh, more harsh than it was in, in the first day. Yes, our attack aircraft, bomb aircraft were doing a great job destroying those convoys in the first couple of days. But now that uh, their position uh, do not move a lot day by day, and they were able to pull all this, um, all this SAMS and all this air defense into their occupied territories, it's not that easy. Uh, our drones, on the other hand, uh, the Bayraktar Turkish-made drones, they're, they're doing an amazing job uh, destroying those co convoys. Really, that's interesting. So where do the drone, drones take off from? Uh, like, um, even if I saw some of those drones to take off, uh, I, I, I wish I didn't know, because they are doing the same as we do. They are uh, doing their best to keep those drones safe right. and to keep the so safe. So uh, with that being said, um, I have no idea where they operate from, but they are pretty capable. They are, they are really long range. They can be easily be operated from any point in Ukraine. How, how long range? Uh, I, I've heard that. Uh, I'm not sure. I think they can stay airborne for up to 20, 24 hours. So. Really? That's, that's yeah. amazing. And, and you've also been using a lot of missiles, I understand. Yes. And that's uh, ground to air or, uh, or what? Oh, we, we've shot a lot of missiles. Uh, air to air, ground to air, a lot. And, and how many uh, jets, uh, how, many, how many planes from uh, the Russian Air Force do you think you've been able to down? Any idea? I think the number that our uh, chief of staff is given, uh, like, like our uh, air, uh, armed force commander is given, which is around, at this point, around, uh, hundred jets and like hundred twenty helicopters, maybe more. Uh, it looks pretty pretty reasonable, at least to me. Really? Now, has Ukraine um, Air Force gone into Russian airspace at all? Uh, not not that I can recall personally. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think we need to do now? Uh. Uh, like I like I have said earlier, the some jets and some SAMs would be would be really great for us. Um, we do not have control over certain parts of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian airspace, and that is where all this harsh and horrible bombardment of civilians is, is happening. 
Um, on top of that, seeing that um, this hesitation or lack of political will to give us those jets or uh, or SAMs is uh, really uh, it does look really disappointing to us. Mm -hmm. So you think that the West should be doing more, both in jets and in SAMs? For sure. Obviously, the uh, the the risk is uh, Putin's threat of uh, of initiating a nuclear attack. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, uh, we do talk a lot about that. Um, that is that is obviously threat, threat. Um, but um, given if 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 you if you assume that uh, they will never use that, they are. Uh, the vast majority of their ground forces and of their air forces are now concentrated in Ukraine. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, it is it is a risk. But if you if you uh, if you presume that uh, they will not use nuclear weapons, uh, there is nothing really. Uh, there is no actual limit to start helping Ukraine because most of their forces are already here, like most capable forces. So some people have commented that um, if Ukraine falls, Georgia, Moldova um, would be next. What do you think? Well, uh, first of all, we will not fall. We shall not fall. Uh, uh, the, like to me, the worst case scenario is that they will keep those territories that they have already taken. And yes, if we will not survive, if we will not win this war, at some point they will uh, I'm 100% sure if this Putin's regime will not fall, they will uh, they will go to Georgia, they will go to Poland. Uh, like their their politics, their media, they they are already discussing. They're showing these big maps and with arrows on how they will capture those Baltic states. And uh, we all feel uh it, and it, it boost at this this thought is actually boosting our morale that we are being on, at the front line on of the like all the western world all all the light the front line of a fight uh, between russia and democracy i guess is what you're saying yeah yes that's what i'm saying so i'm not sure if you uh, you know uh, much of military uh, history um, I've met a lot of people like you that uh, are incredible students of uh, military history um, some people have suggested that World War III started in, uh, in 2008 uh, when uh, Putin attacked uh, um, Georgia or in 2014 when he invaded um, the eastern parts of Ukraine and, and, uh, and took over Crimea. Uh, and, and they compare that to Czechoslovakia um, and Austria in the 1930s and uh, Hitler's uh, moves there. And then they say that, um, that the invasion of Ukraine is like the invasion on September the 1st, uh, uh, um, 1929, uh, 39, I apologize, into Poland. And so that if, uh, if we knew what was going to happen in the subsequent five years, we would have uh, attacked um, far more, uh, we, we would have participated, the West would have participated in the attack on Poland and, and tried to driven Hitler out of Poland. Is there any kind of analogy there that, um, that, 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 Ukraine today is like Poland in 1939. Uh, well, that's that's uh, where I am, and all my fellow uh, fellow pilots and all the militaries I, I know we, we stand for we stand at. So uh, it is just like that. Uh, if we won't stop him now, uh, who knows what will happen next? Um, you're doing a, an incredible job. Um, under unbelievable circumstances that no one ever dreamt, at least I never dreamt would happen again uh, in our lifetimes. Um, why do you think this has happened? No one thought we'd have another war in Europe. Why is this happening? Uh, uh, it is all about the, uh, all about the propaganda and the, the policy that Russia has been doing in its country, uh, especially before 2014 when uh, annexation of Crimea and uh, war at Donbass happened. Uh, we were uh, in a close, in, in much closer ties with Russia. And from their media, we always heard that um, that is not really, uh, 
uh, that Ukraine is not real country, that Russia, that is basically Russia. When I, when I came to States, I uh, always heard uh, like, hey, where are you from? I've said, I'm from Ukraine. Ah, that's Russia, correct? Like America, like regular American would say to me that. And um, so this man, uh, he comes to power uh, and he realizes that, hey, that w- such, it was such an incredible time uh, when the Soviet Union, uh, I mean, the, uh, the Soviet Union time or, or Imperial Russia. And he, uh, uh, he just decided, uh, he just decided that that is his um, uh, 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 life goal to, rep- uh, to try to recreate that, even though uh, Ukraine had, uh, is, has incredible, incredible story. We have a different language and uh, our fight with Russia have, have been for hundreds of years um and uh, it is it is uh, pretty obvious that uh for for putin and for his regime taking over the ukraine is is going to be major success so um yeah that's what i wanted to say but i don't understand how he could ever expect ukrainian people if he was successful to be countrymen um, after he's destroyed cities, murdered people, um, starved people, forced uh, the, uh, you know, somewhere between three and 10, me- 10 million people to be displaced, three million uh, to be refugees. How can he ever expect peace? Uh, well, his, um, uh, his, his regime, which is uh, oligarchy and uh, how did say corrupted regime, uh, he, uh, it, like I'm almost sure that their top military officials, they were twisting the numbers for him before that invasion, and they were telling him, "Hey, uh, Ukrainians will meet you with the flowers. They will be glad to, and um, they will <laughs> they will be glad if you invade." And uh, that's what he actually believed in, and that that what he was expecting to happen. They were telling three to four days and Ukraine will fall, but um, yeah, they hardly, um, they hardly overestimated their own powers and over, uh, underestimated ours. How's the morale within uh, the Ukrainian Air Force? Uh, it is, uh, I, I've not been, uh, it is extremely high, let's say. I've not been, uh, do, I've not been doing job with um, higher motivation than I have now especially since uh, some of my close friends have died and uh, pilots and my squadron squadron died. Um, we, are, um, we are ready to fight. Uh, for uh, doesn't matter for how long. You, you must have some sense as well about what the morale must be in, uh, in, in the Russian army and air force. If you were told that you were gonna be able to take the country in a couple of days and, and you're there a month, what do you think the morale is like within the uh, the Russian Air Force or the Russian Army? Oh yeah, their morale is pretty low. I'm one hundred percent. I am hundred percent sure. Uh, uh, what about pilots? We we have had some pilots, uh, of, uh, bombers and fighters. We we have captured already, and we interrogated them. And what's the result of uh, the interrogation? The most- yeah, of course. I like I've seen videos like they're all social so social social media. I have not, I have never met them. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, their morale is pretty low, and uh, I don't know what those pilots are telling them when they clearly have sorty, uh, where they have red X. I mean the target, uh, just the, like downtown Mariupol, or where school is at. Like there is no way you you uh, you don't know. That it, that is clearly civilian building or hospital, and those um, those those men they still fly, they they do the sorties, they drop those bombs, like uh, we're we we're, we're you know among pilots, Ukrainian pilots, we're discussing like if if you were given order like that, any any of us, they we will just drop the bombs somewhere in the sea or in the field, uh, and say hey we just missed or something like that, and those. Um, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time to, um, to name them with a, with like polite word, 
and they're still doing that. That is that is absolutely horrific, and uh, we'll we'll we are when we are watching this destruction they're making, um, it just makes us mad. So are you saying that if you got orders to uh, to bomb a school in a city in uh, Russia that was close to the Ukrainian Russian border, you wouldn't do oh, it? Yeah. That is that is that is also the question of being in a uh, corrupted country. Uh, not, I, I'm 100 sure that none of our pilots would agree to do that, but they are afraid they 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 can be sentenced to, to prison, or um, maybe they will not get promotion or something. I don't know, and they still do that. What are those people doing? Those pilots. Are you? Uh, do you think you're getting uh, a reasonable amount of information about what actually is happening in uh, in Kharkiv and Maripol and uh, Kiev? I think we. I think we do. Uh, like, I um, I speak English. I can also um, watch some. Uh, you know, uh, I I'm, I'm able to uh, read some information from 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 other countries, not only from Ukraine. I think that the information we're getting is is pretty pretty accurate. Amazing what uh, what you and uh, and the Ukrainian army and air force and uh, and and what 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 are the local organizations called uh, that are sort of independent forces? Uh, they're uh, territorial defense. That's what they what they called territorial defense. It's amazing what they've been able to do. I've seen pictures of Molotov cocktails and uh, and tank uh, barriers and things like that. Uh, I got to tell you, I think you've been inspiring the world. Uh, we're going to take a break for some messages and come back more with uh, Pilot Moonfish, a squadron commander, and MG, a MiG-29 uh, pilot uh, in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's amazing. We've been able to connect up uh, via Zoom uh, to uh, Pilot uh, Moonfish. Uh, he's a squadron commander in the Ukrainian Air Force. He flies a MiG-29 jet. Um, he, uh, he's studied at the avian aviation leadership program in the United States uh, from 2016 to 2017. He, uh, he's been in the air force for a while. He doesn't want to tell us exactly uh, for how long, but he grew up being a dream, having a dream, um, as a young boy of, of being a pilot. Um, probably you never thought you'd actually be, uh, fighting in a war, but I guess that's what you sort of trained uh, to do. And so, uh, um, congratulations and thank you for the, for the role that you're playing. Tell me about. A typical day. What would be a typical day? Do you do you wake up early and wait for uh, for orders, or are you flying at night? Tell me what a typical day is. Um, if you are not like um, we split the the flight duty uh, for like day daylight hours and night hours, so that uh, some some somebody can can rest. Uh, and uh, if let's say if I if I'm if if my uh, duty time is in the morning. I usually wake up three, four a.m. Uh, because we have uh, uh, like sirens when we go to shelter. Um, uh, because uh, as as far as I understand, we get those warnings a lot because uh, it is it is really hard to tell where this cruise missile will uh, will fall will fly to. Uh, I think our C two knows exactly when and where it was launched, but. Uh, the the site of where where it, where, where it will fall is uh, really uncertain and it and it is hard to estimate. So like all of us, we we do know that airfields are their number one target, and usually they they attack like in early morning hours. And every other night we have to wake up early, gear up, take our right caves, and uh, we go outside to, and take a shelter. And then uh, yeah, we go flying, we go duty. And we're just um, reacting to uh, the threats that are possibly coming to us in our area of responsibility. Are you flying every day? Uh, I, I've been, I, I personally have not been flying for a couple of days, but uh, usually that, it, yes, uh, every day, or every day, and or almost every day. And every, every flight is a like <laughs> combat flight. It is really weird. Every At flight first. is a combat flight. Yeah, like, and anytime you 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 go you go airborne, it is um, you know we have uh, 
uh, we have this master arm switch and, and every, every other um, fighter jet in the world where um, you either keep it on or off for, for your armament, just for safety. And uh, we usually, uh, when we were doing uh, training uh, the air to air launches, we keep it, keep it off uh, almost all the time and during uh, routine sorties. But now I have this, I already have this habit in all of us like gear up and master master alarm um master arm switch on uh, we are ready to deploy at any time our weapons how do you deal with the stress uh, uh we'll we'll just try to take a rest whenever time you can even if you're uh, if, if it's your watch uh just just lie down and sleep yeah i started to smoke let's start to smoke <laughs> In a MiG-29, yeah. how many uh, people are on board? Oh, it's a it's single jet, uh, single seat jet. Single seat, so just yourself? Yeah. Yes. Have you flown other planes? I have flown other than MiG-29s. Uh, they're uh, they're training, uh, training uh, aircraft. Uh, they're two seat usually. And what do you prefer? Single seat or double? Okay, yeah, a single seat is. Uh, I I do prefer uh, single seat. Why? Like uh, that is just the way. Uh, I, I would say like if you ask the same question in uh, uh, for for uh, for the US pilot, they will tell you the same. Um, once you have gotten used to flying only by yourself, um, it is uh, way more, I'll say, enjoyable to 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 stay yourself i do like and like any other pilot enjoy flying informations when you can see your uh, like your bodies or your um your wing and um yeah that's what i prefer single seat is is, is my my choice so i think lots of people have watched the movie top gun was your training anything like that uh kind of um not at first of course and um, I've been doing some, me personally, work within Ukrainian Air Force to make our, uh, our training flights, our, um, our air-to-air engagements uh, more look like uh, the Top Gun, Top Gun flights where you do the dogfighting a lot and uh, the dogfighting is way more realistic. Um, but... Uh, it's it's a little bit it's uh, way more boring than that that's what i would say have you been in a dog fight no i personally not what uh what do you think of the training of the russian pilots that uh, you've seen i think their training um uh, their preparedness for for the dog fight is uh very overestimated especially now that uh, i've been uh, at the pilot training in states uh, I am like 100% sure of that. So you think your training uh, in the Ukrainian Air Force or yours personally because you went to the aviation training in the United States is better than the Russians are getting? No, no not, not, not only. Uh, you see the, those problems, they have the, the uh, really much higher bureaucracy than, than we have and much higher um, corruption than, than we have. It affects training as well. It is weird, but it is true. So uh, they are they are jinking numbers all, all the time. Uh, um, and th- of course, that does not affect their training. How does uh, corruption the, from, How does corruption affect training? Oh, um, so <laughs> um, uh, commanders are twisting numbers. Let's say, oh, um, they have to report to their superior commander about uh, like they are mon- monthly training or something and they um, report numbers that are uh, have not been achieved that's it and of course now that those numbers are being reported and documented uh, and still those pilots did not did not achieve uh, those training goals they were supposed to and from those encounters uh, like dogfight and air to air encounters that we had at the very first uh, couple of days of war I would say that yes, our pilots are uh, way, way, uh, way better prepared for the for a dogfight. 
your president has been an inspiration around the world. What do you think of him and the job he's been doing? I think he's doing the great job. He's inspiration to all of us as well. The line that he used about, um, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition, is sort of one of those lines that I think will go down in history. Um, what can he do? What more can he do right now? I like me personally as a pilot. No, you're or, a president. What, what do you wish he could do? Um, what he can do, um, you know, when uh, the war broke, he's become not my president, but my uh, senior military commander. And um, I, 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 have, I have no right to, um, especially right now, to uh, criticize any of his decision, especially since I have nothing to, uh, to criticize about. I think that actions that were taken uh, are, 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 the best, are, are the best they could possibly do. One of the, uh, the rules or laws um, that's been put in place is that, that any uh, male between a certain age cannot leave the country, has to stay. Um, so you effectively become conscripted uh, to uh, join um, the fight. Is that a good rule or a bad rule? Well, we're dealing with uh, a really huge for military force right now. And this war is about surviving us as a country. And uh, like in every country, there are people who are willing to fight, who are willing to um, to defend their their land and uh who are doing, they're, they're just doing all the best. And there are people who are trying to escape. Even uh, those people are um, actually obligated to take take the rifle and go fight. And uh, I'd say that at least, uh, at least said, I don't want this, me personally, I don't want these people who are trying to escape, who are, who, whose legal age uh, telling them to, uh, and, and maybe uh, they are training um, their training is telling them to go fight and they are trying to escape that country. Um, um, I didn't want any of those to ever become like um, any politician or something like that. So uh, all, all of our, like my bodies think that is a right decision to do. There's been a lot of um, talk about a no-fly zone. Uh, your president has uh, repeatedly asked the West to, to create a no-fly zone. Um, uh, above Ukraine. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Well, uh, there's been a lot of talks about this no-fly zone, uh, especially in the civilian environment. Um, it, it sounds sounds probably like a really good thing, right? But um, to provide that no-fly zone, you have to use some some instruments, right? Like air, some, some kind of air defense. And that would mean... Um, that would mean the conf uh, like direct conflict with two nuclear with NATO and Russia, two nuclear capable capable powers. So uh, I do understand why uh, no fly zone is not an option, and I do understand why this uh, was such a um, um, such a big thing in our society. Like, hey, there was there was a time I believe in Israel or something, or maybe uh, I think I'm right uh, that. NATO provided the no-fly zone over Israel. Why they won't do that for us? Um, but the situation right now is uh, is really different. So jets and uh, surface uh, to air missiles and um, cruise missiles and drones. What else do you think the West should be doing? Uh, well, uh, so far um, that West provided us with a lot with a, like a huge amount of uh, anti-tank missiles, javelins, and laws. They're, they're, um, it, it is really hard to underestimate their role in this war. Um, from my perspective as, as a fighter pilot, I think um, if we will be able to grasp our air defense more effectively, that, will, that would create uh, much better condition for our ground forces to um, to to counterattack and take back those territories, or at least do not allow Russians to move any further. And and how do you do that? 
um, well, it is it is typical stuff. So our our attack more equipment. Aircraft, just more equipment. Our, uh, yes, more equipment. Uh, more jets would be great. Um, we we do have, even though it it not seem to be uh, that intense as, as it was first couple of days, first week. Uh, we do um, losing jets every day, like or almost every day. So uh, to replenish those jets, uh, as I said, we have plenty of pilots. We are trained to fly those jets, and uh, our SAM, SAM, SAM guys know how to operate those surface-to-air missiles that are being, uh, that at least there are talks uh, on the social media uh, about. And uh, I think the ultimate, ultimate tool to for us to keep uh, that air superiority in Ukraine would be obtaining any mm -hmm. any any Western jet, like at least on one or two squadrons. How are these um, munitions, these javelins, these uh, surface-to-air missiles, um, the drones actually getting to Ukraine? Are there are there NATO um, planes landing in your uh, in your airports? Oh, oh, Ukraine is a no-fly zone right now. Uh, so uh, I have not, I have, I have not seen personally any any NATO jet landing on our territory since war started. So I, I have no idea how is that happening, how that is happening. The the javelins. Tell me a little bit about them. They're 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 something that uh, is launched from a from a a land position. Oh yeah, those are portable uh, um, anti-tank missile launcher. Um, they're, um, they're launch and forget. Uh, I have not used that. I've just seen videos and had somebody to talk with me about that. Um, they are ex extremely effective again against, uh, any Russian armored vehicles. And how, and, what's, what's the distance that they travel? Oh, I think, I think they, they like two or three kilometers. I, I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm not infantry man. So, and, and any idea how they, uh, how they're designed to locate the uh, the target? Is it a GPS? I think I think they are using the heat uh, heat signature, like uh, infrared signature of the vehicle that is moving. When once it when once it locks, you all, all the operator has to do is to press the button and launch. And you're saying they're very effective. They are very effective, indeed. And uh, what does it do? Does it destroy the tank or just dis disable it? Uh. It usually does destroy the tank. Uh, like from from those videos I've seen and from um, like stories I've heard from some army guys, uh, usually the javelin hit uh, ignites the blows up the all the munition that it is inside of the tank. And if you if you've if you seen the videos with the turret blown blown away from the Russian tank, that's probably the javelin. Really? Okay. And the cruise missiles, where are they launched from? From uh, from uh... oh. Airport, airports uh they launch cruise missile all the range of cruise missiles they have so i've heard that the very first strike at my home airfield and neighboring airfield was made out of a ship the caliber missile that they, they are uh they are they are being launched from the ship but they have used uh, cruise missile that are launched from the ground and from the air and um, what is interesting, though, uh, that they have started to use those uh, air launchers after a couple of uh, like two weeks into war, because uh, th th that is uh, that is saying that they were not ready that this war will would uh, would last that long. So uh, I would say that they they they're launching them out of strategic bombers. They have launched um, the hypersonic missile once at least once that, that i know of and uh, that is saying that that it, they pretty much have used all the armament they they have and those missile attacks are are getting um uh, they, they're not that intense um over time and that is saying that they're just running out of them you know, it's amazing. No one, I, I, I can't believe, I never thought, I don't know if anyone ever thought we'd be in this situation, but uh, you know, you are doing admirable uh, work for democracy for, for Ukraine. Um, 
you've got some listeners in Toronto listening to you right now in Canada. What, what message do you have, if any, for them? Well, um, with knowing that uh, those are uh, civilian people, uh, if you can, just please give our country support, any kind of support you can, so that we can, we can stand and win this horrible war. And uh, for the sake of, of all democracies over the world, and for the sake of all, um, of, for the sake of destroying all, uh, everything evil that, that is in this world. Destroying everything that's evil. Moonfish, a squadron commander in the Ukrainian Air Force, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Yes. Um, please thank stay you. safe. And uh, you know, if you get a chance uh, uh, in a week or so, check back in with us. Cool. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Safe uh, flying and, uh, and good hunting. Get some, uh, you. get some Russian uh, jets for us, okay? Okay. I'll do my best. Thank you. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us, everybody.